Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Cadet First Class Hillary Nolan, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the Class of 1959 Leadership Keynote Lecture. This year is very special, as it marks the 7th anniversary of the formal establishment of the Air Force Academy, which was signed into law by President Eisenhower on April 1st, 1954. This legislation paved the way for the construction of the Academy's campus and the entrance of our first class, the class of 1959, the following year. Please join me in recognizing our generous sponsor for this keynote lecture, the United States Air Force Academy class of 1959. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Chell N. Lindgren as our distinguished guest speaker for this morning's session. Dr. Lindgren, a class of 1995 graduate <laughs> of the Air Force Academy, was selected as one of the nine members of the 20th NASA astronaut class in June 2009. After two years of rigorous training and evaluation, he assumed technical duties in the spacecraft communicator branch and the extravehicular activity branch of NASA. Dr. Lindgren served as the lead spacecraft, spacecraft communicator for Expedition 30. During Expedition 44 and 45, he spent 141 days in space, participating in two spacewalks and conducting over 100 scientific experiments. Dr. Lindgren also served as a communicator of NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station, returning home on October 14, 2022. He has logged a cumulative total of 311 days in space. At the Academy, Lindgren was a member of the Wings of Blue parachuting team, where he served as an instructor, a jump master, and a member of the Academy's intercollegiate national championship team. Dr. Lindgren earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology in 1995. His pursuit of knowledge continued from there. He completed a master's of science degree in cardiovascular physiology from Colorado State University and earned his doctorate of medicine from University of Colorado. His postgraduate journey included residencies in emergency medicine and aerospace medicine, as well as a master of public health. Dr. Lindgren is a board certified physician in emergency medicine. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Chell Lindgren. Good morning, everybody. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here, and I want to thank the class of 1959 um, for sponsoring this keynote and uh, for investing in our cadets um, and for the op opportunity to share. Um, I'm excited to be here uh, because my son, who is a fourth class cadet, uh, I get to, get to be escorted by him here today, uh, so that's a lot of fun um, as he is identifying his, uh, his own path and his own journey. Um, I'm also deeply excited to be here because never in my wildest dreams, uh, when I was sitting out there 30 years ago, did I think that I would have the opportunity to, to be up here and to share um, an experience like living and working in space. But I am most excited because according to all rule and reason, it is an impossibility uh, that I could be up here sharing with you as a NASA astronaut my experiences of living and working in low Earth orbit. Because in 1998, I was kicked out of the Air Force. I was medically discharged from the service. And so I don't know about you, but there is no line that connects a dot of being medically disqualified and discharged from the service to someday becoming an astronaut. I've wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. Um, I was inspired by science fiction. I read, I watched movies, I'm, I was a Star Wars kid, and my favorite book was uh, Runaway Robot, a story about a kid on Ganymede um, having adventures with his robot. It was a dream, it was science fiction. But in second grade, Mrs. Loudon um, rolled the television 
into our second grade classroom, and we watched the very first shuttle launch on April 12th of 1981. And that is when science fiction became science fact for me. That living and working in space is something that I could actually do. And from that point on, I was hooked on this dream. Now, how was I going to become an astronaut? There was no internet back then. The internet was a decade and a half off still. So I read books, and I read the accounts of our early space program and autobiographies of our early astronauts. And every one of them was a pilot and then a test pilot. And growing up in an Air Force family, I decided, all right, this is what I want to do. I want to join the Air Force. I want to become a pilot. I'll become a test pilot, and maybe someday I can become an astronaut. And so I charted a path for myself. Um, I remember actually filling out a postcard that I found in one of my dad's Air Force magazines that said, yes, please send me more information about the Air Force Academy. Because I figured if I'm going to join the Air Force, I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. And so I sent that card off with uh, much anticipation and never heard back. Um, it may have been because I was 11 at the time, <laughs> and we were living in England, uh, but I was undeterred. And so after moving back to the U.S. and graduating from high school uh, in Virginia, I had the great uh, privilege of receiving an appointment to the class of 1995. <whistles> Keep the pride. Um, came to the academy, and uh, I was on the path that I had laid out for myself. I worked hard here, uh, and the first obstacle I encountered was Calculus 3. Uh, I, decided, I figured if I'm going to become an astronaut, um, I should study astronautical engineering, and uh, Calc 3 did not agree with me, especially after lunch. Um, I was having trouble staying awake, to be completely honest, and, and so I tried Calc 3 again, and it still wasn't working. Um, and I was in biology at the time and having a blast. Passionate, I felt that I had a knack for it. And I had a, had a deep curiosity about how the human body ad adapts to, the, to weightlessness. And so I switched my major to biology. And upon graduation, secured a pilot training slot because I still wanted to fly and serve um, as a fighter pilot but I deferred that slot to go off to graduate school um, to really dive in to this, this study of uh, how the human body reacts to, to weightlessness. And so I went to Colorado State University. I studied cardiovascular physiology with really a focus in microgravity. Went out to NASA Ames Research Center to do human research. It was amazing. But then came back eager to start flight training at Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma. I made it about a third of the way through T-37s. Um, and then I went to the flight surgeon with what I thought was a cold. And the flight surgeon kind of hemmed and hawed and tapped his chin and said, I think that there's something else going on here. We need to do more testing. So I was pulled out of the cockpit. That was fine. I didn't really feel like I had symptoms. And so really had no concerns that I was not going to be able to get back into the cockpit and continue. I was doing well in flight training, both academically and flying, but I found myself pulled out um, for about a six-month period of diagnostic uh, evaluation. Our medical, my medical evaluation board met, um, but prior to that, I was thinking, you know what, I don't have symptoms, I'm going to continue to fly, but I also know that the Air Force is a large organization that doesn't necessarily have my interests at heart. And so I started taking night classes to prepare for the MCAT, medical um, admissions test, and started applying to medical schools with the plan that if for some reason I couldn't continue to fly, that I could offer this back to, to the, the uh, Air Force and say, hey, I can serve in this manner. Well, my medical evaluation board met, and to my um, surprise and dismay, not only was I not going to be permitted to continue to fly, but they were recommending that I be discharged from the Air Force. I appealed that decision 
I got a letter of support from the chair of the biology department that I could come back and teach for two years and serve out my obligation. And I felt that obligation deeply. The Air Force had provided me with an education here, um, the opportunity to go to graduate school, the opportunity to fly, and I wanted to complete that obligation. Um, but the appeal board met and upheld the decision that I was to be discharged. This represented the complete obliteration of a dream that I had been working towards for most of my life. Devastation. I kind of liken it to descending into a, a valley of despair. Where do I go from here? I leaned on my family, on my friends, and on my faith. I remember very clearly my UPT class graduating. Great friends, um, watching them get their pilot wings and selecting the aircraft, the platform that they were going to be flying. So excited for them, but it was bittersweet because I felt like I should have been there with them. The next day, uh, my wife and I were headed out of Enid to go to a coffee shop. There were no coffee shops in Enid. Uh, so we were making a drive out to Stillwater, stopped by the, the mailbox, and inside was a package, a big, thick package from the University of Colorado accepting me into their next medical school class. So as one door closed, another door opened. And I found value in this new path. It was an opportunity to serve the community and to challenge myself. And so I dove into that. Went to school up in Denver, four years, and then charted a path to, to, to train in emergency medicine up in Minneapolis. Now, in our training program there, uh, we, we will serve in the hyperbaric chamber, taking care of critical care patients who've either been exposed to carbon monoxide or have had a dive injury. You can't serve in, in the hyperbaric chamber with asthma. And so I got tested. And they said, you don't have asthma. And I thought, huh. So I got tested a number of other times, of course, because of the role that this diagnosis had had in my professional life and was cleared of that diagnosis. And for me, that opened a door to maybe participate in human spaceflight in some way. So after finishing residency in emergency medicine, I moved down to Galveston and uh, did a second residency in aerospace medicine. Graduating from that, um, I had the great privilege of being, um, accepting a job at, uh, at NASA as a flight surgeon, most of the time living and working in, in Star City in Russia, taking care of our crews that were training for their space station missions, um, when in 2008, NASA announced a new astronaut selection. So I threw my hat in the ring and, had, um, and, and won the lottery and got selected into the class of 2009. Did two years of, of, of uh, astronaut candidate training and then flew my very first mission riding on a Soyuz rocket, launching to the International Space Station. And I have an indelible memory of when our launch shroud pulled away from our capsule, uh, revealing the view from the window, and, and I had a window right next to my head, and looking out and seeing for the very first time with my own eyes the gentle arc of uh, the Earth's horizon during an orbital sunrise. Amazing. Getting to the space station, um, I had the gift of, of getting to see the Earth from that perspective, of getting to float, um, and, and, and really the, the realiz realization of this lifelong dream. But the greatest gift that I had from that experience was the gift of perspective. From that vantage point, looking back at my journey, looking at one of the darkest days in my professional life, the day that I was military, um, medically discharged from the Air Force, a dark day, maybe even a cursed day, and recognizing that day as a blessing. 
because I can tell you with almost 100% certainty that had I not been kicked out of the Air Force, I would not be here today. This story, this opportunity pivots on me being discharged from the Air Force. That perspective is a powerful one for me. The gift of getting to see what that day represented. Many of us go through incredible hardship and challenge and don't get to see the bright side of what that, that challenge actually represents. We lack the context, we lack the perspective. So I'm grateful for that. Now, I share that story with you because for, for many of you in the audience, you've experienced those days. And for you cadets, if you haven't experienced those challenges, those dark days, they lie ahead. Obstacles, challenges, trial, tribulation, lie in your path. So how did I get past that? How, how do we bridge that gap? How do we climb out of that, that valley of despair? For me, that resiliency comes from connection. Connection to who and connection to why. So the connection to who. Those are the people in our lives, our network. They are our friends and family. They are um, our instructors and teachers and coaches and teammates. They are that network on good days and bad days. This opportunity, the experience of living and working in space, the opportunity to serve as an astronaut, is not an individual accomplishment. It is a reflection on all of the people that walked alongside me during my journey. Teachers, coaches, teammates, mentors, family and friends. This opportunity is a reflection of their investment in me. Similarly in the space program, we few astronauts who actually get to fly and serve on the space station are one infinitesimal part of a larger team. We are the eyes, ears, and hands of exploration. And yet, we absolutely could not accomplish what we do on our own. It is the investment of trainers, instructors, flight controllers, engineers, fabricators, thousands of people investing millions of hours at Johnson Space Center, at our NASA centers across the country, and with our international partners across the world. It takes a team, and human spaceflight is the ultimate team sport. That is the who that we get to rely on. Some of the smartest, brightest, most, enthusi most enthusiastic people that our country and the globe has to offer, and I hope that some of you will come and join us at, uh, at Johnson Space Center someday. Who are the people that you lean on? Who, are, who do you connect to? in your squad, on your teams, and as you move into the Air Force. Invest in those connections. Invest in the who. Because connections encourage communication. Communication enables trust, and trust is the currency of leadership, of teamwork, of being effective in your roles here as cadets, and in what you will do in the Air Force and Space Force. Invest in those connections. The other connection is the why. The, my why very early on was clear. I wanted to be an astronaut. I was inspired by Star Wars. I wanted to have a robot and have adventures on Ganymede. But as I matured and as I got closer to the, maybe achieving this goal, the realities, the odds became more clear. And my why matured. As I got here to the academy, Sure, I would still love to be an astronaut, but the why became a desire to serve. And that's why that transition from the Air Force to medicine was possible, because in my heart, I wanted to serve. My why changed after my first flight. I had been working my entire life to fly in space, realizing that dream. I had this profound moment just a couple weeks into my mission of 
hey, this is spectacular, but now what? What is it that's going to motivate me? And after returning home, um, I really thought about that a lot and, and then invested in the idea that I wanted the others in my office to have the same extraordinary experience that I had had on orbit. That became my why. The other why that was defined in orbit came from this incredible opportunity to look back at the Earth from this incredible vantage point. To look to the left, to the right, up and down, the Earth is surrounded by the inky blackness of space. It is all that we have, and that becomes profoundly clear when you're looking at it from space. This is it. And someday, maybe we will become a multi-planet species, but we will always have to protect the Earth, protect our home, because it is uh, created in an extraordinary way to support um, human life. And as I looked at the Earth, it's very clear that, uh, that humanity has changed the face of the Earth. Now, there are good reasons to do that. Agriculture to support our populations. But we also, there are many days where I couldn't see China because of um, just a cover of yellow pollution, haze. Forest fires in South America, um, the entire Midwest, our mid entire Midwest covered uh, uh, by the, the uh, needs for agriculture. Again, there are good reasons to do it, but it became clear to me that we need to be better stewards of what we have here on the Earth. On the space station, it is absolutely clear that if we do not take care of this spacecraft, we will die. The spacecraft provides us with air to breathe, food to eat, protection from the vacuum of space, from the temperature extremes, from radiation. And so we do, about 30% of our time is spent in, pre in uh, preventive and corrective maintenance. And yet when we return home, Earth, our spaceship, humanity's spaceship, provides us with food to eat, water to drink, air to breathe, protects us from the extremes of temperature and from the vacuum of the void, and yet I would hazard to say that very few of us spend 30% of our time taking care of the Earth. This was a new why for me, and I wanted to be a part of um, being a better steward for this planet, and so it caused me to change my time. I spent more time as a scoutmaster focusing on conservation and outdoor ethics, and my wife and I both became Texas Master Naturalists. To, to help educate and volunteer. The why is important. What is your why? As you serve, as you encounter trial and tribulation, as you encounter challenges, as you enter into some of those dark days, that why matters. Why are you doing this? And it's important to connect with it. When I take people around the Space Center on tours, um, occasionally family and friends will come in. It's actually a joy for me to see the Space Center through their eyes. I've seen that stuff, I've worked in the, the modules for hundreds of hours, and to see the enthusiasm and marvel um, that they experience reconnects me with the why. So find ways to reconnect with the why. So for you cadets, as you progress through or proceed um, through your journeys. Don't let others define what is possible. Let your hard work create opportunities and open doors. And as you follow and lead, as you encounter challenges, Remember to connect with your who and to connect with your why. Those connections will sustain you and encourage you as you make the impossible possible. Thank you.
So I think that we have time for questions. Is that right? Anyone? Do we have time for questions? OK. All right, so I think that there are mics up in the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, I'd be happy to answer. And if not, I, can always ask I will questions. give your day back. <laughs> oh, people are eager. And if the first question is, how do you go bathroom in space, <laughs> I will not be surprised. With your medical training in cardiology, what impact did space have on your heart? And when you returned to Earth, what actions did you take to regain full function if you lost any function? And what is the future impact on long-term space flight like to Mars? Yeah, great question. Um, it was an amazing circle to navigate, to have studied the cardiovascular system, my research was actually focused on a countermeasure to some of the changes that we see in space. And the opportunity to actually wear that countermeasure in space um, during my mission was, was an incredible experience. L living and working in low Earth orbit in that weightless environment is actually really hard on the human body. It's as if rather being in space, you're laying flat in a bed for six months. And so that results in bone uh, mineral demineralization, a weakening of the bones, because you are not loading your skeleton. It results in muscle atrophy, because you're not working against gravity. Um, it results in cardiovascular deconditioning, because your body does not have to work against the force of gravity. And so these are all, our bodies are incredible. These are adaptive mechanisms, responses to the environment, and if you're going to stay in space for the rest of your life, your body's conserving energy and it's doing a great job. But in the sense that we all want to come back home, they are maladaptive, and so we have countermeasures to work against those. And those are an exercise bike and a treadmill to maintain um, aerobic fitness, and a weightlifting machine called ARED, the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, essentially a universal gym that uses evacuated cylinders to provide up to 600 pounds of resistance. And we use that to load our bones, to maintain bone um, health and density, and to, to fight off muscle atrophy. Most of our crew will come back in better shape, um, with better strength and better aerobic fitness than when we left. Because we have about two and a half hours of dedicated exercise every day, and few of us, even with scheduled exercise, are able to achieve that on the ground. So I would say that, uh, that most of us, and me included, um, my, my aerobic, my cardiovascular health was better than when I left. Uh, but that is not to say that we feel normal when we get home. So we still, uh, the bottom line is gravity is a, is a bummer. Um, and it takes time to get, uh, to get used to it. I, I would have sworn I had Bose headphones that I wore on the flight back from uh, where we were recovered. Same Bose headphones that I used on orbit same style, and I could have sworn that somebody had put nickels in it and, and was messing with me. Uh, it's just remarkable how heavy gravity makes you feel. And it takes different time for our systems to readapt. So our neurovestibular system, our sense of balance, takes about a week and a half to get to a point where when you move your head, you don't feel like everything is spinning. Um, the musculoskeletal system, we have muscle aches for about 30 to 45 days. Uh, and then those start to resolve. And so all of these different pieces uh, recover over time. So that about a month and a half, you're feeling pretty normal. But on the day that you get back, uh, you can't stand up straight for about the first 15 minutes. And in about an hour, you can stand up and walk assisted. At six hours, I was walking pretty quick unassisted. And so you can see that uh, those changes, um, it's, the human body is pretty remarkable. Thank you. Uh, let's see, over here. Good morning, sir. Uh, my question's about the medical side. So how, what skills or things that you learned while you were practicing being a doctor and eventually becoming a doctor that you applied almost in, in space or just throughout your career that really helped you? Sure, thank you. So I think this is really important. I think one of the really remarkable things about who we select as astronauts, and that is, if, 
as long as you're coming from a STEM field, at least right now, um, there is an opportunity. We select a diversity of backgrounds. Now, back in the 60s, it was all pilots and test pilots. But as soon as we hit the end of Apollo, moved into Skylab and shuttle, uh, we were selecting scientists. And so in my class, in the cl subsequent classes, we have engineers, microbiologists, um, folks studying, studying oceanography. Uh, we have educators, physicians, and pilots. And that, what you brought to the office, though, um, ultimately is reset as soon as we start to train. We all train, start do the same training. And so in astronaut candidate training, or as we refer, lovingly refer to our candidates as ASCANs, um, <laughs> we start Russian language training. We study space station systems, both for nominal and contingency operations. How to use the robotic arm, how to do spacewalks. And for all of us, probably the most challenging thing um, Oh, I'm sorry, that Russian language training is the most challenging thing. Uh, we have the opportunity to fly in the T-38, which is our space flight readiness training. Um, and so we train to become astronauts. And so on orbit, just because there's a medical experiment doesn't mean that I'll be doing it. Uh, a pilot may be doing that. So we are all cross-trained against almost everything that we need to, to accomplish in low Earth orbit. But for me, uh, well, and the other thing that I think is a lot of fun is that as we encounter problems, we all come at it with our background, the culture of how we think about things and attack problems. And so a physician, an engineer, and a pilot sounds like a bad joke, but we all, um, <laughs> we all attack a problem in, in slightly different ways. And it's really fun to leverage that experience and background. For me, working in the emergency department, I'm working with a small team, uh, highly technical domain requiring eye-hand coordination and a body of knowledge that was fed to me through a fire hose. Uh, in an environment where I'm making decisions with limited information that have life and death consequences. And many of my colleagues coming from, from other backgrounds have similar experiences, but we were able to leverage that in the space flight environment. Thank you for that question. Yes. Um, sir, going back to your time at the academy, what lessons did you learn here that helped you down the road to becoming an astronaut and through all of the different things you faced along your way there? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, this is going to sound like propaganda. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am deeply, deeply grateful for the experiences that I had here. They were not all good ones. But the opportunities that were afforded me here um, are just mind-blowing once you actually talk with folks from other colleges. Um, and so I'm grateful for those experiences. Uh, the other piece of it is that, uh, you know, we talk about challenges and obstacles. That's built into the academy experience. So you will find that you're doing things you don't quite understand why. Um, things that don't make any sense and feel like a waste of time. And guess what? You're going to experience that in whether your career is in the Air Force, Space Force, or in business. And so having an infrastructure, an approach, a philosophy to be able to deal with frustrations like that is incredibly powerful. You're learning things here that you don't even know that you're learning, and you won't realize that you've learned until about 10 years out. Um, I'm grateful for the friendships that I developed here. They are friendships that I have maintained even though I departed from the Air Force very, very early on. Uh, classmates, teammates, um, grateful for those. And for the, and again, the opportunities to, to get to be a part of um, the parachute team here. That became really the center of gravity for my social and academic and military life. And that was, and that is, that's just one part. There is drum and bugle corps. There is falconry. Um, those opportunities to, to spend time in and to develop connections with who's and why's um, abound here. And, uh, and so I'm not one of those graduates that, you know, was grateful to see the, the academy in the rearview mirror. I came back here and as, as soon as I could. I continue to connect with the biology department, with my old squadrons, with my classmates, 
And uh, I hope for the cadets that are here and that are listening that you will give the Academy uh, grace in that respect and recognize that it is helping you to develop um, in ways that you don't even know. I hope that helps. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, sir. Thank you for speaking. Uh, my question is, if you seek to make a change, but you can't necessarily connect all the dots right now, what's your advice for connecting them in the future or even making new dots when you can't see the whole picture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, will, I will tell you that hard work, that success is almost entirely hard work. And so nobody told me to start taking night classes when I was a casual officer working in flight scheduling advance for six months. Nobody told me to apply to medical schools. That hard work, whether it keeps you on track to the primary goal that you have your sight set on, um, that hard work is gonna open, create opportunities and open doors. People are gonna see your character, see your work ethic, and they're gonna offer opportunities and networks up to you such that you may actually divert from what you thought you wanted to do and pursue another one of these opportunities that have been opened up. And so I, I would tell you that as you encounter these, uh, these challenges, um, lean on your team, lean on your who, refine your why, and identify other opportunities that are out there because doors may open that bring you back someday to what it is that you ultimately wanted to do. But that, I, I can't um, understate enough that hard work. We've had people that applied to the astronaut office, which to me was like the pinnacle of a dream come true. We offered them an interview and because of the work that they had invested and the other opportunities that they had, they declined because another opportunity had opened up. That's amazing to me. And I think it's a testament to what, um, what, hard, what hard work can do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have time for one more question. One more question. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Cadet Third Class Aaron Wilford from Squadron 12. You had mentioned in your why, you said it was your family, friends, and faith. I was wondering how your faith played a role in you becoming an astronaut and the path leading up to that. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, that we all have something that anchors us beyond just what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so for me, I'm grateful to have been brought up in um, a, a family that, that, that valued uh, that faith connection. And it is something that I have, um, that has just been reinforced in my life over time. I've experienced uh, too many miracles uh, in, in my life um, to think that there is not something greater than us. Uh, and so that is just for me something that I leaned on in challenging times and recognized that there was a silver lining, that there was a greater, um, a greater good out there that I just was not aware of. And so to, to then have the opportunity to fly in space, to look back at my path and to see um, what I thought was a devastating experience actually turn into something that, uh, that has given me this opportunity to fly in space. Um, it was sustained and has reinforced uh, my faith. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to, to the NCLS team um, for inviting me to come and speak. Uh, it is an absolute privilege to be able to, to share the unique experiences of living and working in space and the experiences of this journey. I wish you all the best. Congratulations to the first E class under 100 days um, till graduation. Congratulations to the class of 2027. Uh, man, that was pathetic. I had a pause. <laughs> set up there for you guys. Is the class of 2027 here? Oh, we're awesome. I love it. On uh, 21 days to recognition, 
I wish you all the best in your journeys. Remember to connect with your teams and connect with your why. Thank you. Dr. Lindgren, thank you again for your time today. Your experiences and perspectives speak to how we can embrace culture and empower people. On behalf of the United States Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this token of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made from marble from the TZO, as you are aware. This is foundational to us because all cadets had to run the marble strips during their freshman year. We hope that this brings back memories of your time here, that you will look on this and remember your NCLS experience fondly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. This concludes our session. Please share your immediate feedback in the NCLS app. Select the session button and click rate session. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.